Hi, I'm David Scranson and thank you for clicking this video because today we're answering all your important retirement questions. And joining me with this so important task is Sam McElroy, partner with Stride Financial, a retirement income store located in Chicago. Sam, always our pleasure. Thanks for being here. Absolutely, my pleasure. So in talking about retirement planning in general, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see folks making when trying to plan for their own retirements? Yeah, I think there's a number, but some of the biggest ones that I see people make when they're trying to plan for their own retirement is thinking that the same rules that they played by during the accumulation phase when they were accumulating wealth are the same ones that are going to carry them to victory or success in the decumulation or distribution phase. You know, one of the biggest fallacies is this thought that just getting a better rate of return necessarily means that you're going to have more money at the end of the day. And just not understanding how the math kind of changes on you once you start to take a withdrawal from an accumulated asset pool. So what do you think then to solve that problem? What do you think is most important for people watching this to understand about retirement planning, especially if you're within 10 years of retirement? Well, I think a couple of things. Number one, you got to remember that championship teams have to be able to play defense as well as offense. So I think one of the biggest problems people run into is if you look at the balance with respect to their return and where it's coming from with respect to either income or price appreciation, I think most people are tilted too heavily towards that G side, towards that price appreciation side, and they don't have enough balance. In many instances, that actually makes them more susceptible to a lot of phenomenons like reverse dollar cost averaging or sequence of return risk. And the way that they need to alleviate that is just making sure that they have the right balance between income or growth. So said differently, when they start to move into that transition stage, which would be 10 years prior to distributions or the distribution phase, they have to start to demand income as a priority on their investments. Come on, Sam, you're a collegiate quarterback. Don't you know it's all about the offense? Come on, that was your motto back when you were playing, right? That's right. But you know what? Everybody, especially the quarterback, knows that if they don't have a strong enough defense, it puts more pressure on you, the offense, because you have to try to outpace or outrun the other team. But you can have a, a wider margin for error as a quarterback, so to speak. You don't have to score quite as many points if you know that your defense can protect the points that you do kind of gain. You think people are starting to realize that now? Do you think people are more concerned today in light of what's happening in the markets? Yeah, I think it's definitely starting to shake a couple of people who had been lulled into a sense of complacency. I think that when things are going you know, really well for the market, people think that it's always going to be that way. And they forget that markets and cycles always move through periods. They always expand and contract. And, and it almost catches them by surprise when we start to have volatility, when in reality, uh, we've probably been due for some of this volatility for some while now. So people are starting to get it. The question is, are most run-of-the-mill financial advisors starting to get it? Or are they the typical offensive coordinator who doesn't realize that there's a need for defense? Yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, the defensiveness from an advisory standpoint, I think it used to be really prevalent decades ago. But ever since the 80s and 90s, I think there's been a shift with respect to how advisors are being trained and the tools that they're being given. And everything really has been focused more on just total return with this fallacy of a belief that if they can just score enough points, if they can just get enough of a return, then they don't have to worry about any of the problems that can emerge from a distribution standpoint. But I think that you know we've had a number of periods. This isn't the first one. We have the NASDAQ crash in early 2000, the subprime mortgage crisis. We had 2018 that finished down. We had volatility in 2020. So it's like every now and then, the market has to throw another curveball out there just to shake us and remind us of the importance of making sure that we have good fundamentals in our portfolio. And we're not simply just trying to swing for the fences every single time. So there are times when maybe as an income-based advisor, when growth and momentum stocks are just, just skyrocketing, where maybe you underperform a little bit, right? But then there's times like this where being an income specialist really can help people with the goal of reducing their risk. Uh, and, and at the same time, if you're retired, uh, have no interruption of income. So, uh, you know, explain a little bit about why that works. Yeah, I think that the reason that it works is because people forget 
that how much income is being derived from their portfolio, I mean, assuming that it's structured properly, isn't really based on the value of the assets. It's based on the quantity of shares that you own or the quantity of units that you own. So what a lot of people don't realize is that when they're in a position where they're forced to liquidate part of the portfolio in order to take a withdrawal, they're actually permanently forfeiting some of the income that was being produced by the shares that they actually liquidated. And that shifts the whole risk profile over time. But when you can make sure that the withdrawals that you're taking are coming from new dollars actually being created, not from selling an asset that you have, then it puts you in a position where when there is volatility, you can actually wait it out the same way that you did when you were in the accumulation phase, because you still possess and own the same quantity of shares. And so when the market rebounds, you get the full brunt of that rebound, even while satisfying that income need that you had the whole while. Yeah, it's, if you think about it, it's kind of like renewable energy versus burning fossil fuels. You know, one eventually can run out and the other one, you know, you get more the next day and more the next day. And, and that's what makes it, I guess, the simplest way to put it, right? Yeah, I think absolutely. And, and it's such a good analogy because if you think about this whole idea of running out, it's not just actually when you get to the point when you run out, it's the whole period leading up to when you run out, all the stress and anxiety and the emotions that kind of come with it that play havoc on us from a psychological standpoint. It makes it really hard for us to predict and expect what our future is going to look like. And research shows us that we as humans like to be able to control things. We like predictability, especially when it comes to our livelihood. But when people lose that in retirement, I think sometimes they underestimate the impact that can have on quality of life. Yeah, uncertainty is what brings on anxiety and you can't enjoy retirement if you're anxious about your money. So speaking about being anxious, what are your thoughts about the economy and the markets over the next two years or so? Are you more optimistic or are you a little pessimistic? Uh, talk to us about that. Well, I, I think, Dave, it depends on the day. <laughs> okay. Um, I think in general, you know, there's, there's an old saying that, you know, bull markets don't die of old age. And there's some truth to that. Just because things have been going well for a period now, there's no reason for us just because of that to think that now they're going to start to slow down or be sluggish. But at the same time, over the last however many years, I think we've been mounting or accumulating a number of things that are maybe going to be problematic for the market. We have domestic things that are happening, whether it's just inflationary pressure, the Fed trying to raise interest rates to try to put a tamp down on that but having difficulty because of all the geopolitical sell-offs and everything else that's been happening. We have a number of things just uh, in the government, the potential for raising of taxes that we're still working through as well. But if we look uh, internationally, there's just so many things that are happening these days. And the geopolitical sell-off between UK and Russia uh, are just one of them, but we still have the UK that's working through Brexit. Uh, Brexit. We still have uh, issues that are happening in Ethiopia. We have things that are going on in Afghanistan. We have you know, Evergrande in China, which actually did default, but somehow we forgot and lost track of the ramifications of all that. And the list kind of goes on and on and on. So is there a, a valid argument to be made for why things are going to be more volatile and sluggish moving forward? I think there definitely is one that people could make. So final thoughts. Yeah, final thoughts. Uh, I think we got to go back to something that you kind of highlighted a little bit earlier, Dave, which is uh, when people are within 10 years of you know, when they plan on taking money out of their portfolio, whether it's income they need or whether it's a forced distribution from RMDs, it's so vital and so important that they really focus on not just price appreciation, but how they can position themselves so that whatever happens in the market, good, bad, or indifferent, doesn't have the ability to rob them of the confidence that they want to enjoy in retirement. And in order to do that, they're going to have to get the income part of the portfolio structured appropriately. And unfortunately, um, they may have to be their own advocate because a lot of advisors out there just have never been trained in the art form of how to do that part of the process. Great. Sam McElroy, always good thoughts. It's our pleasure having you. Look forward to seeing you again on the Income Generation. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up button to give us a like and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel for new content each and every week.